Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us. We're going to give it a couple of minutes to fill the room here. Good afternoon again, everyone. We'll give it about another minute or so to fill the room. And we'll give it about another 30 seconds here to fill the room. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you once again for joining us for our weekly Wednesday webinar series. Today's webinar is on danger signals and inhibitor development. My name is Brett Spitali. I'm the Vice President of Advancement here at the National Hemophilia Foundation. At any point during the webinar, if you would like to ask a question, please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. We have NHF staff members monitoring these questions, which we'll pose to our presenter after the presentation. This webinar is being recorded and will be available to the community beginning on Friday, June 11th. I'm joined today by um, Redick Kazmarek. Um, he's from the Indiana U University School of Medicine, Department of Pediatrics, Gene and Cell Therapy. Thank you for taking the time to, to join us today, Radek. And I will now turn it over to you to get us started, sir. Thank you so much, Brett. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you for joining. Uh, my name is uh, Radek Kazmarek. I'm a uh, postdoctoral research associate at the um, uh, Gene and Cell Therapy Group, as um, uh, Brett mentioned, at the uh, Indiana University School of Medicine. Uh, I also happen to be the chair of the uh, Coagulation Product Safety Supply and Access Committee of the uh, World Federation of Hemophilia. And today I'm going to talk about the role of danger signals in the immune response to clotting factors in uh, hemophilia. So here is the outline of my talk. Um, I will walk you through what we know and don't know about immune response to factor eight and nine. Uh, then I will discuss the danger model of immune response. And finally, I will try to summarize what we know about the impact of danger signals on inhibitor formation both from animal as well as uh, clinical studies. So let's start with a little reminder. Uh, inhibitors to coagulation factor eight or nine are ILO antibodies that neutralize the replacement therapy in about 30% of patients with hemophilia A and about 5% of patients with hemophilia B. Uh, most of what we know about inhibitor formation comes from the studies on factor eight inhibitors. But the immune responses to factor eight and factor nine follow similar principles, although two uh, notable differences uh, exist. The obvious one being incidence, uh, because inhibitor occurs rarely in a hemophilia B. And uh, the other being the fact that up to 50% of patients with severe hemophilia B develop severe allergic reactions to uh, factor nine, which are extremely rare in hemophilia A. So what do we know about the mechanism of inhibitor formation? Uh, we know that following intravenous, uh, intra in intravenous uh, injection, uh, antigen presentation cells take up factor VIII, uh, process it, and present its epitopes on major histocompatibility complex II molecules in secondary lymphoid organs. Uh, CD4 helper T cells recognize the presented factor VIII epitopes, uh, activate to proliferate, and go on to help factor VIII specific B cells to proliferate and differentiate into memory B cells and antibody producing plasma cells. Uh, all in all, we have a good general understanding how the immune response ensues and progresses. However, uh, there is a whole lot we still don't know. Um, there are major gaps in our understanding of what exactly happens from the moment the exogenous factor eight or factor nine protein is injected into a vein uh, to the emergence of neutralizing antibodies. For example, we don't know which antigen presenting cells play a role and what exactly is their function on the way to uh, T cell activation. Uh, 
digital antigen presenting cell substance um, that occupy distinct compartments in lymphoid organs. And so some of what happens might be dictated by the architecture of the spleen, something that cannot be replicated in many of the uh, studies that you will see in the field. Uh, uh, there is a distance that the antigen or its fragments have to travel from uh, blood to T cell zones, and different parts of that path are populated by distinct immune cell types. For example, there have been reports from animal studies in the last few years proposing that various subsets of macrophages residing in the marginal zone play important roles in the immune response to factor VIII, but we don't know exactly what they do. Uh, we don't know if they actually come in contact with T cells and activate them because macrophages and T cells in the spleen seem to be physically separated by other cell types, including dendritic cells. It is likely that various subsets of antigen presenting cells cooperate and play different roles in the initial antigen capture and activation of T cells. And it will be important to tease them out to fully understand the immune response to replacement therapy. In general, we have quite a lot of data on genetic and non-genetic risks, risk factors uh, for inhibitor development, but not much of those data are conclusive. Uh, there is strong evidence that major gene mutations predispose to inhibitor formation, so, and so do family history and ethnicity. Uh, the evidence is also quite convincing that such non-genetic factors as uh, intensive treatment at first exposure and uh, treatment indication uh, play a role. Conversely, we have quite uh, strong evidence that there is no association between factors such as mode of delivery, as in uh, cesarean section or, or vaginal delivery, or product switching and inhibitor formation. And there is a whole lot of proposed genetic and non-genetic risk factors on which the jury is still out due to conflicting data or lack thereof. Uh, these include blood group, the uh, uh, factor VIII gene haplotypes, uh, HLA phenotype, as well as a whole lot of immune or inflammatory response-related gene variants. One of the non-genetic factors that have been debated for a while and recently came back to the forefront um, is the so-called danger signals. So to understand why they became part of the conversation, uh, let's take a quick trip down memory lane and take a look how the general theory of the immune response has evolved. Um, the first comprehensive model of immune response, bringing the field together at the time, was proposed by Frank McFarlane Burnett, who postulated that the immune system works by telling cell from non-cell. He proposed that each B-cell carries a specific receptor that recognizes foreign antigens and that self-reactive lymphocytes are deleted early in life. Uh, from today's perspective, that was an impressive intellectual feat because there was no evidence for many elements of this theory at the time. Uh, even the T cells were not even known yet. Um, uh, but despite that, most elements of his model were later proven experimentally. Um, and yet the model has failed over the years to explain a great number of immunological conundrums. Um, for example, what happens when the cell changes? How do organisms go through puberty, metamorphosis, uh, pregnancy and aging without attacking newly changed tissues? Why do mammalian mothers not reject their fetuses or attack their newly lactating breasts, which produce milk proteins that were not part of earlier cell? Uh, why do we fail to reject tumors, even when many clearly express new or mutated proteins? Uh, why do most of us arbor all reactive lymphocytes without any sign of autoimmune disease? Um, something which is true also in, uh, in the case of the factor VIII delivery. Um, uh, why do we fail to make immune responses to vaccines composed of inert foreign proteins unless we add adjuvants? So uh, many questions uh, like that have remained unanswered over the years. And subsequent models of the immune response attempted to address these questions. Uh, first, a uh, major update to the theory of a self non-self uh, discrimination was proposed by Charles Janeway, who proposed that the uh, uh, immune system evolved to discriminate infectious non-self from non-infectious cell. And that model was inspired by the discovery of pattern recognition receptors, which are 
innate immune sensors of foreign molecules, such as bacterial lipopolysaccharide or non-mammalian nucleic acids. And then uh, poly, another major update, update which, has, uh, which is the background of this talk, um, was proposed by uh, Pauli, uh, Pauli uh, Matzinger, uh, who proposed the danger model, which in some ways, uh, on the one hand, elaborated on the Janeway's model, suggesting that the immune system responds uh, to the damage by, by sensing the uh, exogenous uh, uh, infectious foreign uh, entities. Uh, but it went further because it also suggested that there may be an endogenous source of the of the danger signal, which uh, of the danger signals which um, the immune system otherwise does not get exposed to. Um, in other words, uh, the idea was that the immune system is more concerned with the damage uh, than re than and responding to the damage than than uh, discriminating uh, our cell from non-cell, and this became an attractive model to uh, formulate hypothesis on the inhibitor formation uh, because it addresses many of the puzzling aspects of that phenomenon. Um, for one thing, factor VIII is not infectious uh, and except for large gene deletions, it is, it is difficult to really call it foreign, um, uh, even in individuals with intron inversions, as has been uh, demonstrated in, in, in uh, a couple of papers in recent years. Um, so, the, the danger model seems to offer plausible explanation on how environmental factors often accompanying the therapy could impact the uh, immune response to it. Um, so uh, specifically in the case of inhibitor formation, the hypothesis would be that exogenous and endogenous uh, triggers like infections, uh, vaccination, surgery, or severe bleeds uh, uh, generate necrotic cell damage and consequent, consequently dangerous signals that could prompt the immune response to coding factor, with the factor becoming a sort of a collateral victim of their response. Um, so um, let's see if, if the theory has uh, passed uh, the master. The master. So let's see it. Uh, let's look at the uh, uh, preclinical data first. Um, in vitro uh, uh, treatment of human monocyte derived dendritic cells um, from healthy donors uh, with uh, combinations of factor VIII and lipopolysaccharide, as, as mentioned before, um, uh, one of the foreign exogenous danger signals. Um, increases expression of co-stimulatory molecules in dendritic cells compared to factor VIII or uh, LPS alone. Um, uh, lipopolysaccharide is a very potent agonist of uh, TLR4, uh, total like uh, uh, receptor 4, which is a pattern recognition receptor. Now, while uh, CD86 is not only a dendritic cell activation marker, but also an important um, co-stimulatory molecule that participates in uh, activation of factor eight specific uh, helper T cells. Uh, and uh, interestingly, um, that effect was found only for the plasma derived, but not the combinant factor eight. The same authors um, later found that human uh, monocyte de derived dendritic cells posed with combination of factor eight and uh, LPS again enhanced proliferation of helper T cells in vitro. And um, they also showed that T cell proliferation depended on antigen processing and presentation because uh, T cells um, failed to proliferate in their assay when they blocked um, MHC2 uh, or treated dendritic cells with uh, bufalomycin uh, A1, uh, which uh, inhibits um, uh, and the somal part of the antigen processing pathway in antigen dendritic cells. A number of studies looked at factor VIII as the, the potential source of danger signals, either by um, itself carrying or directly generating such unidentified signals, or indirectly by propagating blood clotting per se. Um, these hypotheses were prompted by the many established links between uh, the coagulation system and inflammation. In one such study, the authors incubated
displayed at human monocyte derived dendritic cells with factor eight alone, uh, or in combination with from Willebrand factor or uh, with um, uh, thrombin activated factor eight. But they did not find any um, effect on differentiation of dendritic cells or their capacity to stimulate T cells or change their cytokine profile. They concluded that none of the tested factor eight forms or combinations acted as a danger signal to um, human dendritic cells. Similar hypotheses, uh, similar hypotheses uh, have been comprehensively tested in animal studies. Um, a study by Skupski et al. Uh, and uh, co-workers from uh, 2009 published in Blood um, showed that hemophilia A mice mounted uh, weaker immune responses to heat inactivated factor VIII or when it was combined with anticoagulants. Um, so, so that it wasn't able to perform its proper agent, um function. When the, other, when the authors administered, um, co-administered a model protein um, uh, with thrombin, um, uh, the, the model protein being uh, ch chicken uh, ovalbumin, they found increased responses to ovalbumin compared to when it was administered alone. So they concluded that it is uh, factor eight's procoagulant function that induces the anti-factor uh, eight immune response, not a signal inherent to the molecule. Their conclusion, however, was later disputed in another animal study, also published in the journal Blood, uh, which showed that inactive factor eight mutate, mutates um, encoded by naturally occurring, uh, encoded by um, uh, Factor eight uh, encoding gene variants uh, containing naturally occurring inactivating mutations um, were no less immunogenic than their uh, wild type counterpart than the, than the fully functional functional uh, uh, factor eight. They argued that heat inactivation tested in the previous uh, study may have destroyed the B cell epitopes on the factor eight molecule. Also. They did not find any effect of tissue factor inhibition or warfarin on uh, anti uh, factor eight responses. Again, ruling out the uh, um, uh, pro 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 procoagulant uh, uh, function of factor eight, uh, no matter direct or, or further downstream. What about surgery? Um, studying uh, the effect of surgery uh, is difficult because the effect. Uh, uh, of sur the surgery uh, often naturally coincides with peak uh, treatment when uh, uh, high doses of uh, hemostatic protection have to be used. Um, so these, the authors of, of these two, two studies, the first one, they um, uh, tested the effect of laparotomy um, in a mouse model uh, in, in mice with hemophilia A, and they, they found that it did not provoke the development of factor eight inhibitors in, in the mouse model. Um, similar um, joint bleeds and uh, arthropathy uh, in another study did not favor the development of factor eight inhibitors um, in the same mouse model. Uh, however, in uh, rats with hemophilia A, um, the uh, uh, hemarthrosis joint bleed significantly enhanced inhibitor responses to um, uh, recombinant. Uh, interestingly, they also found that uh, joint bleeds in, in those uh, rat hemophilia, uh, in the rat hemophilia model, uh, induced local, both local and systemic inflammatory response. Um, what about uh, clinical uh, data? Uh, so uh, there has been a number of reports um, analyzing the uh, effect of, of uh, uh, surgery and uh, bleeding, uh, both uh, joint bleeding and, and other bleeds, including like threatening bleeds on the inhibitor development. The first two studies that I'm, uh, that I'm looking at here um, uh, were also characterized by, by continuous infusion, uh, another potential uh, confounding uh, factor in that analysis. And um, yeah, they did find um, 
increased um, uh, formation of high titer inhibitors, which suggests that uh, overall of, of intensive treatment as, as well as surgery potentially. And um, a later case series of 54 boys with mild hemophilia A in 2003, um, it was found uh, that there, there was the same association with four, four individuals developing inhibitors following uh, continuous um, infusion. In a, in a cohort of um, uh, 138 boys with uh, moderate or moderate or mild hemophilia A, um, seven developed inhibitors after intensive perioperative treatment, but no association with um, uh, lead treatment was found in, in that study from uh, 2009. In uh, larger studies, um, again, uh, the uh, results were, were quite inconclusive. In a multi-center cohort study, including 236 previously untreated patients, um, major surgical procedures were um, uh, indeed associated with a 2.4-fold increased inhibitor risk. risk. Um, what was also um, uh, strongly associated with, with inhibitor risk was uh, peak treatment for at least five days at the time of surgery or peak treatment. Um, uh, another large study, the CANAL study, uh, standing for concerted action on neutralizing antibodies in severe hemophilia A, um, uh, which was a Molly Center retrospective cohort study, included 366 patients and showed over threefold higher inhibitor risk for surgical procedures. And um, again, the peak treatment moments um, uh, also increased the risk um, at the start of treatment. Um, all in all, 65% uh, of patients who were first treated for surgery developed inhibitors in contrast to 23% and 22% treated for bleed or prophylactic uh, risk. Um, uh, similar associations were also found in, in the uh, um, uh, Rodin study, um, including 606 uh, previously entered patients. In a more recent large study, including 625 uh, POPs uh, surgery, but not bleed treatment, uh, was associated with a 2.4-fold uh, uh, higher risk of inhibitor formation. A case control study, including 108 um, children, comparing uh, compared 60 inhibitor patients with 48 controls, and uh, it did not find a significant significant association with uh, surgery. 25% um, patients in the inhibitor uh, developed inhibitors uh, compared to 23% in the control. Admittedly, this this study was uh, was smaller and and uh, Consequently, less power than the previous studies or the cut. Uh, a case control study with 78 patients in each group uh, didn't find the association. There wasn't even a, a trend for, for the role of surgery with, with 22 controls developing uh, inhibitors compared to 17 in the uh, inhibitor group. Uh, also, this time there was no association in the subgroup receiving intensive treatment for for five days uh, around the surgery. Something that uh, that was found to be associated uh, before. And uh, and uh, overall, in studies looking at uh, previously treated patients, there was uh, consistently um, no association with. Um, uh, surgery and uh, inhibitor risk. What about bleeding? Um, in a Molly Center cohort study, including uh, uh, 236 previously uh, untreated patients that I mentioned before, uh, peak treatment for at least five days uh, at a time of surgery or bleeding, uh, uh, when it coincided with first, uh, when, when it was delivered at first exposure, was associated with 2.1 fold higher risk of inhibitor formation. Uh, in another uh, more recent study, McLean and co-workers found uh, as high as 4.1 um, fold increased risk of inhibitor formation uh, associated with uh, life-threatening bleeding. 
A Moly Center study by uh, Vizina and co-workers found 7.6-fold and 5.1-fold um, uh, higher uh, risk associated with hemochromosis and intra intracranial hemorrhage, respectively. On the other hand, uh, again, in a previously uh, mentioned um, yeah, large study um, uh, by Santa Agostino and co-workers, there was no significant association with um, uh, the central nervous system reading um, that compared 60 and uh, uh, 60 inhibitor patients with 48 controls. Uh, and, and another um, relatively recent study uh, bleed first exposure was not associated with inhibitor formation uh, either. So another question that uh, uh, has been lingering uh, for a while and recently came back to the forefront uh, uh, due to the uh, COVID-19 vaccination campaigns um, is whether vaccination plays any role in inhibitor formation. Um, so let's first look at um, preclinical data on this. Um, vaccines, uh, the vaccine, uh, the MMR vaccine, so the um, uh, 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 combined vaccine for, for measles, mumps, and rubella was found to have no impact on inhibitor formation in mice with uh, hemophilia A. Um, even more interestingly, influenza vaccination um, in that study reduced inhibitor incidence, even in the presence of uh, an adjuvant. And uh, these, author these authors found that um, uh, T cells in mice uh, with uh, the in mice that received the uh, influenza vaccine um, were um, uh, traveling prevalent, prevalent, prefer preferentially to the site of um, vaccination. Uh, importantly, all vaccines tested in the animal study were against uh, single-stranded, uh, single-strand um, RNA uh, pathogens. Uh, oh, both, yeah. uh, I mean, all measles, mumps, and uh, rubella uh, viruses have single-stranded um, RNA uh, genomes, and uh, so does uh, the influenza virus. So, uh, which prompted the question, um, uh, if the impact of dangerous signals may depend on which innate immune sensors become activated upon challenge because uh, there are pathogens, including uh, pathogens that we use vaccines against, that um, contain uh, uh, single stranded DNA genes. And uh, in terms of the um, impact of immune, innate immune sen sensors recognizing uh, foreign nucleic acids such as a single strand of DNA, uh, there has been some indirect evidence that uh, they may uh, modulate, they may impact um, antibody formation. One such uh, indirect piece of evidence is, uh, is um, uh, increased uh, N factor uh, 9 um, antibody formation in uh, experimental gene therapy in animal model. Um, uh, administration of um, uh, potent TLR9 agonist uh, together with an AAV vector encoding uh, effect of regulation of factor 9 um, increased um, uh, response against the transgene product, so uh, regulation factor 9. So, uh, I try to answer the question um, in, in my research project whether TLR9 uh, activation could impact inhibitor formation uh, against uh, factor eight replacement therapy. And I found that uh, in the animal model in mice with hemophilia A, uh, it did actually. Administration with factor eight 
of factor VIII with potent TR9 agonist, uh, both enhanced and accelerated inhibitor formation in hemophilia A mice, which does prompt a question of uh, what would be the impact of vaccination against uh, single strand single strand DNA pathogens such as uh, varicella lazostin to vaccinate against as well. So, is there any any uh, reason to worry about this uh, from the clinic? Uh, well, it seems uh, there is. Um, there was no association with vaccinations or infections in a uh, case control study that I mentioned before by Sant'Agostino and co-workers. Um, uh, neither was there any, any uh, sign of um, uh, impact of concomitant infection uh, on inhibitor formation in uh, McLean and co uh, study. Uh, and uh, in the most recent and the most well-powered uh, study that specifically looked at this issue at the impact of vaccination, uh, which was which is data from the PETNET registry and included 375 previously untreated patients with severe hemophilia A um, and who, who had received uh, vaccinations within, within the first 75 exposure days. Um, that study did not find significant associations with uh, inhibitor formation, regardless of the vaccine type, and it did include. Uh, uh, vaccines against uh, various kinds of pathogens in terms of the kind of uh, uh, genome that they uh, that they harbor. And, uh, also, uh, no association between proximity of vaccination and the time of infusion uh, of factory infusion was found. And this uh, issue has become important, as I mentioned, has has returned to the forefront um, as. Uh, uh, the vaccination as the vaccines against uh, SARS-CoV-2 were being uh, uh, rolled out. And, and based on the available data, which do not suggest to, uh, to, to uh, make any modifications to, to, to guide the clinical decisions of vaccination um, uh, in terms of hemostatic protection around the vaccination, uh, the um, uh, the committee, committee that I chair for the uh, World Federation of Hemophilia, uh, also in collaboration with uh, the European Association for uh, Hemophilia and Allied Disorders, uh, the European Hemophilia Consortium, and uh, the uh, National Hemophilia Foundation, um, advise that uh, for patients with uh, severe and uh, or moderate hemophilia A or type 3 uh, from vertebral disease, um, the injection of uh, factor 8 or factor 9 uh, uh, should be given before uh, intramuscular injection to uh, provide hemostatic protection for those individuals uh, without, uh, without worrying about the risk of uh, inhibitor formation since clinically there is no uh, evidence so far uh, that uh, vaccination uh, might factor rate or factor 9 inhibitor formation in patients with hemophilia. So in summary, uh, there has been a, a number of studies in the field uh, looking at the uh, potential at, uh, of various danger signals and, and trying to reconcile um, what we see in the clinic with, with the danger theory. Uh, and, however, uh, the, the results, the results are, are largely um, inconclusive uh, for for each aspect uh, theoretically generating dangerous signals, uh, there are studies that, that suggest um, that there is an effect and studies that, that suggest that there is no effect. Um, uh, or conflicting results, the, the probably the actually the only area that there is a relative clar clarity, at least in the clinic, is, is uh, vaccination and infection studies. Um, performed so far consistently uh, found no association between vaccination and uh, infection and inhibitor risk. So um, in conclusion, uh, our understanding of inhibitor formation is, is incomplete. Um, the, uh, the danger model does provide an, an interesting, attractive uh, theoretical framework for, 
formulating hypothesis uh, and, and testing hypothesis in inhibitor research, but supporting evidence is scarce and uh, uh, even if it exists, it's largely incomplete. Uh, importantly, multiple confounding factors may impact inhibitor formation incidence, in addition to just exposure to a factor rate, many of which are impossible to, to eliminate, such as um, uh, exposure to uh, intensive hemostatic treatment uh, on surgery. Uh, so, uh, in general, we definitely need more research and probably come up with, with uh, novel strategies to tackle this problem. Thank you for your attention. Great, Reddick. Thank you so much. We appreciate it. We do have a few questions that came in, if you don't mind answering them and sticking around for us here. Um, first one comes in. Um, you showed studies where there, where the mouse model demonstrated no association between joint injury and the development of inhibitors, whereas the rat model did. What is the difference between these models that could explain this? Uh, great question. Uh, the, the, sh the short answer is I I, I don't know. I, I don't know what could have um, really accounted for the difference from the standpoint of uh, of the species. I, I I don't know any uh, any specific difference beyond, between uh, these models that could explain uh, the difference in the response. <laughs> Great. Um, the next question comes in. Um, I've heard that breastfeeding can prevent inhibitors from developing. Is that true? And what what's the basis for that? Uh, no, there, there, there have been studies that looked at this that I didn't uh, cover here because I specifically focused on, on the danger signals. Uh, but in, in, in the studies that looked at this, uh, no association uh, in between breastfeeding and um, uh, Immune tolerance were found in the context of, uh, of factor rate um, inhibitor formation. And in terms of other maternity aspects, uh, no associations were found either. Uh, aspects such as uh, the mode of delivery, uh, for example, vaginal versus cesarean section delivery, uh, were examined, and so far, no significant no associations were found between these. Great, great. Thanks, Redick. The next question that comes in, what are some of the current limitations when studying inhib inhibitors and how would you suggest we can overcome these future studies and future studies? Oh, there is a number of limitations. I guess it would, would cover another, another hour. Uh, well, for one thing, um, one of the limitations is that many of the in-depth studies that we can perform in the animal models, such as uh, 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 testing uh, uh, surgery or, or analyzing specific like lymphoid tissues and uh, running those um, uh, cytokine, cytokine pan panels <laughs> locally, um, we are not able to do uh, a lot of that. And, uh, and humans for obvious uh, ethical reasons. And, um, and then on the other hand, uh, animal models, uh, the, 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 the big downside of the animal models is that anim the animals used as models, mice and, and, and rats are not humans. And there are, uh, even though their, their immune systems and their coagulation systems are remarkably similar to, uh, to their human counterparts, still they are not identical and important differences um, exist. Um, I think that um, one of the important um, changes that we will need to make in the way we look at the inhibitor problem uh, will be to focus more on the um, uh, what the immune cells involved in the response uh, do and how they do that uh, in vivo. As I mentioned, this is a largely uh, overlooked uh, aspect. And again, an aspect that can only be studied in, in the animal models, uh, not in humans. Um, but there have been a, but still they may be largely uh, informative. A lot of the uh, studies uh, suggesting associations or, or, or seemingly disproving them in the animal studies, such as the uh, in vitro studies that I showed in the beginning using human uh, dendritic cells, um, the, 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 the main weakness of the studies is that we have uh, two or three um, uh, cells uh, in isolation, in vitro, uh, without the 
uh, context of the tissue that they operate in. And as I mentioned, those different cell type cell subsets seem to be uh, occupying different compartments in, 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 yeah. in the liquid tissue where, where the uh, immune response to gravitational vacuum takes place. And that compartmentalization, that our tissue architecture seems to play a role uh, in the immune response. So I think we this is this is the direction we have to look at to answer some of the unanswered questions and to explain some of the conundrums that we, are, that we haven't been able to uh, solve so far. Great, thanks, Redick. Um, the next question that comes in, can, can inhibitors develop against Against what, sorry? Come on. Um, heme Libra, against Heme Libra. Against Heme Libra, yes. There are uh, at a much lower rate, uh, but it was already seen in um, Heme Libra clinical trials. There were out of the me memory serves out of uh, 398 uh, yeah, patients uh, included in clinical trials. Uh, three, I believe, developed neutralizing antibodies. Uh, against uh, emesizumab and I think, uh, and there has been a number of other reports, uh, a few, uh, I think two or three uh, case reports in the, uh, since uh, developing, uh, I mean, describing uh, cases of anti-emesizumab neutralizing antibodies, but uh, the, uh, in general, the, the phenomenon is, is much less frequent than, uh, than in the case of factor eight. Great, great. Thanks. Thanks, Radek. The next question that comes in, um, the snippet study showed that using um, R factor eight has a 87% higher risk of inhibitor development in patients, um, in, in PUPs, patients, um, um, uh, as compared to using um, PD factor eight, and they wanted to get your thoughts and comments on that. Yes, this is this is one of the uh, uh, one of the most contested issue around the network formation. Again, one that I didn't cover since this is unrelated to the, uh, the danger signals. Uh, but uh, it's it's true that the SIPIT study was the. Um, had all the right tools to uh, to answer the question in terms of the study design, and it did um, suggest that. But I, I I believe that the jury largely is still now. Uh, uh, there there have been uh, follow up papers to see the study that uh, uh, that uh, uh, disputed some of the uh, aspects of the study, and. And, and I think uh, as we look at um, uh, looking at, at new uh, regulation factor concentrates that have recently been uh, launched on the market and, and looking at inhibitor incidence uh, in patients using those new products. Uh, I think that the kind of frequencies, the kind of incidence we see there um, Ju still justifies the lingering doubts about whether the difference is legal. Great, great. Thanks, Radek. Um, the next question comes in. Um, you showed a substantial amount of the client's research. How do you envision these to be translated to, in, to clinical studies and beyond? That? Right, right. This is, uh, this is a challenge, as I... Uh, as I mentioned, uh, elements of the studies that we uh, run, such as uh, intravital microscopy, which allows for uh, in-depth analysis of uh, cell cellular interactions uh, in situ, uh, these studies are not amenable for, for translation in humans. And also, there are uh, architectural differences between uh, tissue, between tissues, tissues from humans and, and animals uh, in terms of the uh, a fine architecture of the spleen. Uh, there, there are differences, and also uh, many of the uh, immune cell types that have been very well, very well characterized in uh, animal, animal models, and, and, and mice especially, uh, 
have not been have not been characterized in humans as well and uh, some cell types that actually we we consider to be uh, equivalent in humans to their mice counterparts such as the marginal zone b cells that i mentioned uh, uh, there is uncertainty whether whether that identification is correct so i think there's a there's a long way to go there in terms of uh, in terms of fully characterizing the response uh, in humans translating it is will be a, a major challenge but i think that that first teasing out those uh those phenomena uh in animal models uh, since we have really great tools that are available now will will inform whatever studies we will be able to do in humans in the years to come Great, great. Thanks, Radeka. Uh, the next question that comes in, have, um, have antigenesis of TLR4 uh, been used to prevent inhibitor formation in your mouse model? Uh, not in my mouse model. I, and I don't believe, I don't believe that TLR9 antagonists, uh, TLR, uh, TLR4 uh, antagonists uh, have been tested. Uh, in other context, context in the context of gene therapy, uh, mostly uh, the impact of uh, uh, TLR9 inhibitors and, and inhibitors of other toll-like receptors uh, have been tested. Uh, but uh, uh, those studies weren't looking at at, uh, at inhibitor formation, but general immune response to uh, uh, to the vector. I don't believe any any difference in response to to the transgene product was found in those, specifically those that used uh, administration of inhibitors. Great, great. Thanks, Rick. We got a couple more questions here for you. Um, the next one is, um, I, I heard you say that you were on a WFH committee that is looking at factor safety. How are inhibitors diagnosed and managed in the developing world? Uh, that's a that's a that's a big question. That's a big question. Uh, there is a, a huge work that the World Federation of Hemophilia is doing in uh, promoting education, including on the laboratory aspect, um, uh, globally. Uh, in uh, since both the uh, uh, access to uh, to reagents as well as expertise um, is lacking in, in the developing world uh, often. And the WFH is doing a lot uh, to, to close that gap, both in terms of providing the expertise, providing the education, as well as, uh, as uh, facilitating access to uh, to reagents via determinate uh, programs. Um, it's, it's, it's a challenge. Uh, I've, I've uh, I'm personally uh, doing some volunteer work and, and, and uh, some years ago uh, as part of the uh, um, twinning program. I saw firsthand how, uh, how uh, disadvantaged those uh, uh, developing um, countries can be in the way they uh, diagnose inhibitor formation, but also hemophilia in general. Uh, huge work to, to do there. Huge work is being done, but a lot more work will, will be needed to be done to fix this. Great, thanks, Ray. Um, Len, this might be one that you wanted to chime in on as well. Thank you there, sir. But um, I'll, I'll pose the question to Redick. Um, knowing the understanding of inhibitor formation is clear, what should patients know about inhibitor screening? Sorry, Brett, but you were breaking up a little bit. Could you please uh, repeat the question? Sure, sure. I'll repeat the question. Says, Knowing the understanding of inhibitor formation is incomplete, what should patients know about inhibitor screening? What should patients know about uh, inhibitor screening? Correct. Cur uh -huh. Screening, correct. Screening. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, well, definitely patients should know. The first thing that patients should know is that if they... Uh, notice reduced efficacy of their uh, on-demand or complex of treatment uh, with the replacement therapy is that they should screen for uh, inhibitor formation. And since this may be uh, one reason uh, that, that the efficacy gets reduced, and, and especially if it gets completely reduced. Oh. <clears throat> 
So Brett, maybe I'll chime in a little bit too. I think yes, sir. this is one of the priorities that the CDC has uh, and that NHF and our cooperative agreement are working closely with the CDC uh, to ensure that patients understand patients with hemo severe hemophilia um, and actually all types of hemophilia, but also those who have type three von Willebrand disease are uh, you know, tested at least once a year for inhibitors. Uh, so it's important that they're visiting their uh, federally funded hemophilia treatment center um, and are ensuring that they are getting uh, inhibitor testing done on an annual basis. And of course, any time before uh, an invasive procedure or surgery, these individuals should also uh, be uh, undergoing inhibitor screening uh, and testing. Uh, you know, I think inhibitors remain one of the major problems that we have in, in hemophilia and type 3 von Willebrand disease. So it's an area that we're, we're focusing, uh, you know, educational efforts on uh, for patients as well as healthcare providers. So uh, you can get more information on our website about inhibitors as well as on the CDC website. Very important points. I fully agree. Um, great. We've got uh, one more question, right? That that came in, and this might be a good one to uh, to tie things up on. But um, with the continued advancements of novel non-factor homeostatic therapeutics, how will the landscape of inhibitors change, and what should science focus on moving forward? Uh, great question. Again, um, question. Uh, Thing coming to the forefront as we see, uh, well, as 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 uh, um, emesizumab is becoming uh, more and more widely used, and uh, the uh, potential first exposure to factor eight may be may be largely delayed, and also as patients uh, um, getting on emesizumab and or other uh, non-factor replacement therapy um, and get off their prophylaxis and uh, may not be exposed to, to the uh, standard therapy for a long time. And then, then they, for any reason, they may come back um, uh, to their previous standard to the frequent access to factor eight uh, or nine. Um, and uh, the question is, uh, will they, uh, uh, the risk of developing inhibitor of those scenarios uh, be any different? And nobody knows at this point the answers to those questions. They are, um, yeah, they are becoming more important. Great, Rick. I, I do. Go ahead, Len. Brett, I, Brett, I have a question. Yes, please. Uh, maybe, maybe it could be our last one. So, Rick, a, a, a while ago there was data that was published around. Um, the differences regarding factor eight products um, and their use in different races. Different um, uh, factor eight products uh, seem to have a different predilection to develop inhibitors in blacks versus Hispanics versus Caucasians. Um, and then I think there was some contradictory data to that. Where do you think that, that research stands at this point regarding um, the source of factor eight and racial predilection? Uh, I think that the, um, the consensus in the field is that uh, we don't have sufficient data to support this yet. Personally, I think that there is an effect and that there may be an effect knowing the data that, I mean, based on the data that I've seen and trying to uh, integrate those observations with the theory of how the immune system responds to uh, the, to those proteins. This is actually, I mean, from the standpoint of from the standpoint of um, one of the reasons for this is uh, different haplotypes being uh, showing different frequency and different populations uh, in a ethnicity dependent manner, including. Um, Different haplotypes may, uh, I think, explain uh, those differences. Uh, since we are talking about uh, factor eight molecules having slightly different structures, um, 
in those individuals and that would actually be one of the aspects easy, easily explained by that, that original McFarlane Burnett model that I discussed in the beginning of my of my talk of recognizing uh, telling a self from uh, from non from non self not fully of course because again we have we have um, some patients who develop a response and some who don't uh, and it's and it's not a uh, black and white uh, situation uh, but in terms of thinking in, in, about this in terms of recognizing self from non self i guess uh, uh, I, it's it's plausible to me that there is a difference thank you um, Redick, we do have one more question that snuck into the Q&A, if you don't mind. Um, the question is, is there a correlation between switching products and inhibitor development? No, this is actually one of the areas that I think there's clarity on. Uh, there has been no association found in any of the studies that have this so far. Great. Great. Thank you for that, sir. So I, I'd, I'd like to take the time to, to thank you for joining us this afternoon, Radek. We, re, we truly appreciate it. You're, you're spending your time and, and your expertise with us. And we, um, we appreciate everyone else for being here. Thank you very much, Radek. Thank you so much again for the invitation and for the opportunity. Thanks, Radek. Appreciate it. Thank you. Ron. Please note that uh, this recorded webinar will be available on Friday, June 11th at uh, hemophilia.org under the events tab for our, with all of our other archive webinars. Also available is the event, and the events tab is the um, upcoming schedule for our weekly Wednesday, Wednesday webinars. Thank you once again for joining us, and we'll see you next week.